Welcome to the Visionaries Podcast, sponsored by Alchemy. I'm your host, Jim Maroos. The Visionaries Podcast shines a light on financial institutions at the cutting edge of digital transformation, providing with the tips and tricks to elevate your digital game no matter what size your organization is. Digital banking transformation is most successful when it combines internal and external execution. This includes a focus on employees and culture, back office transformation, and a commitment to both members and the community. Michigan State University Federal Credit Union has grown consistently over the last five years, reaching $7.5 billion in assets. They have done this with strong leadership and a continued investment in modern fintech solutions through a wholly owned credit union service organization, Reseda. My guest in the Visionaries podcast is April Clovis, president and CEO of Reseda Group and Michigan State University Federal Credit Union. We discuss the power of investing in new technologies and fintech solutions that are deployed internally and sold to other credit unions. So I was fortunate to meet April at the Financial Brand Forum, where she participated in a panel on innovation and digital banking transformation. I was intrigued by the way that MSU FCU had doubled down on modern technology and fintech solutions through their wholly owned credit union service organization, Reseda. So April, before we discuss what makes Michigan State University FCU unique, can you share a little bit about your extensive career at your organization? Sure. Um, So I will be celebrating my 27th year this fall um, at the credit union. I started when we had 100 employees and $400 million in assets. I always tell people that to give perspective. Oh my gosh. Um, And today our organization is, um, you know, north of 7.5 billion. We have 1,100 employees. I know in the financial space that still makes us a small institution, um, but it feels big to us. Um, I started in our marketing department. I have a marketing background. And then I, I also, you know, have to say I'm old enough that the internet did not exist until I was working. And I had the opportunity to do what I would classify as digitize our organization and meaning, you know, take our our operational processes from a member point of view and do our first versions of all the digital channels that we all, you know, prolifically use today. Um, so create our first website, create our first, you know, desktop banking, create our first um, mobile app and wow. online chat and um, live chat and, um, you know, emailing and all the secure, you know, forms for applications for new accounts and loans and all of that great stuff. And so um, that really changed the trajectory of my career to have some operational background and knowledge and um, put me on a path to the position I'm in today. My predecessor uh, had some options to select some internal candidates to be prepared. And so after I do, you know, what we called back then e-commerce work, I moved into, you know, being COO and learning the rest of the organization. And uh, just over eight years ago, I moved into the CEO role. That's a long career, though. That's pretty cool. At one organization, no less. So it's yeah. interesting that your career at MSU, FCU, started as a marketing specialist. You know, I was having a conversation recently with a group of peers overseas about the lack of marketing executives who actually end up in the CEO role. How did your education and early role in marketing prepare you for where you are today? Well, I, I look at it from a couple of aspects, really, in the sense that first in a marketing role, you're really focused on the consumer. And what that means is, you know, the voice of the consumer. How does the consumer put you in their consideration set to make a purchase? Uh, how to understand what consumers want in products and how to think about the next product that you could build for a consumer to meet their needs that they may not even know they have at the moment or how to express. And sort of think, you know, for me, that really helps us as we're looking, you know, what do members want? So we remain relevant. I think that's a very helpful skill set to have in, you know, the education background that I have. The other part that I would say has been very beneficial is I've 
you know, you have more focus on communication and your communication styles. And I have, you know, I tell everybody I'm the biggest, you know, orator of the organization. I have to, you know, speak to the board. I speak to employees. I speak to members. I, you know, promote the organization. Um, I represent us in the community. And you have to be able to understand how to message different groups, um, be comfortable speaking in public, all the things that we had a lot of practice and expertise in in my courses. Um, and so I think that really helped as I moved into this role because, again, the the communication part of the background is my number one job responsibility most days. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. In the last eight and a half years as CEO, you've experienced, to say the least, a massive amount of change in the industry and at your organization. What would you consider to be the biggest challenge you faced during this period when you were at the, been at the helm at the credit union? Oh, man, there's so many. Let me see which <laughs> is the biggest. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of people might say some of the things that are experiencing today. Um, it is a challenging time with increasing rates and, you know, adjusting to the new CECL accounting methods. Um, but the truth is, I wouldn't say that's our biggest challenge because, we modeled for it in our ALM modeling and our asset liability management. You know, we've been prepared. We knew how this would look in these scenarios. Um, and so what I would say for me is the biggest challenge is keeping up with changing consumer needs. And, you know, we as an organization, I think, have a, a bigger mandate to stay relevant. It isn't as easy to in our case, right, appeal to a student coming to Michigan State that you need an account at a credit union, right? People have to understand what a credit union is. They have to understand why they need to switch from their parents' institution. Um, They want all these things that maybe we couldn't have done ourselves or at our size had access to. And so I really think the success that will drive us for the future is making sure we're relevant to our members in the very long term. And and that's evolving every day. So it's, it's a challenge. So taking the other side of that coin, what would you consider to be the biggest accomplishment you've had as CEO and somewhat connected? What would you say sets your organization apart from the peers you have in both the Lansing area and beyond? You know, I always, I come back to, and I know that, you know, some of what we want to talk about for sure is our work at um, our Rosita Q show. And and that is a great accomplishment and very unique. But, you know, in addition to that, I always say our workplace culture. And I say that because we can't do some of the new and exciting, innovative things that uh, we need to do in order to be relevant, grow and be successful if we don't have employees who want to go on that journey with us. Um, so I'm always really proud of that we have great retention rates, that we score high, you know, in a Gallup Q12 survey that um, our employees, you know, participate in great workplaces to work and all of those things. Um to demonstrate that we also take care of our employees and that we have a great workplace culture. And so I think I'm really proud of that. Um, I would say what it makes us unique that is pretty fun to talk about is our Reseda group activities. And um, that's setting up a you know wholly owned subsidiary of the credit union that is a credit union service organization where we've made uh, you know over 20 plus investments um, or acquisitions in financial technology companies to make sure the credit union space has access to new technology that our members might want. So I'm going to st- stick with that whole thing around the employee thing because I think. We sometimes take for granted culture, and I, I think, you know, we, we talked about it before the podcast that sometimes we don't realize how much of a role a leader has in whether or not a, a company moves forward, if they become modernized, if they can accept technology, if they can accept change. It it became astounding to me, the number of awards your organization has, has received around being a great place to work. What do you do, do you think, or what does your organization do to make it so it's a great place to work? Because, you know, there's a job and there's a career. There's places where people want to work. But it, what we found in our conversations with different executives is it really transcends the organization. It makes it so everything else works better, but it also makes it so that 
commitment to the community and commitment to your members becomes easier because everybody's on the same page. So what do you think really sets you apart from that perspective, from a, from being a great place to work in a culture that really makes it so employees love it there? I gosh, there's, you know, it's, it is, you spend time and effort on it is, and I just uh, think that's really important. So it is something we continually nurture, and that's probably the first thing to talk about. Um, we have core values. We hire to our core values. We talk about them. We celebrate them. Um, for us, I think what we really work on is a transparent, honest communication. And I think um, that seems really easy and obvious, but it also takes time. Um, you know, I do regular town hall meetings with employees. I do, um, we have a weekly update video from, you know, what's happening at the organization. And I participate in that along with all the other leaders and people doing new projects. Um, we publish newsletters that are employee focused. We, um, really do a lot of listening sessions. We do Q12 employee survey from Gallup. We do the diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging Gallup survey. Um, we have employee affinity work groups. We, um, we have a diversity council. Um, we have, um, I do something called a president's council, which, you know, people apply to be a part of, and I have four, you know, I have a meeting once a quarter, uh, to, to hear feedback, you know, like we didn't score well on X question in the survey. And, you know, for us, well means we didn't hit world class, but, you know, we're well above a four something on a five point scale. Um, and ask, you know, what can we do better? What is lacking? Why, why couldn't you give us a, a good score here? Um, and really learn from employees what they need for the organization to help them feel successful in their role. Um, so I think we're just on a, on a constant journey of ensuring the employees feel um, heard, cared for, and then have meaningful, engaging work that is really important to our mission and, and everything ties back to, I hope you came to work at the credit union because you believe in the mission of the organization, that you want to serve our members, you want to help them have a better you know, personal financial future because we've been able to put them in a better financial position. And we talk a lot about that. I meet with all new hires in their first month. Um, so we just do a lot of what I would say activities to, to provide access to me, to leadership, um, and, and ensure that employees are, are where they want to be in our organization. And, you know, all of my leaders that work with me do the same thing. That's interesting because you've grown quite fast and you talked about how big the organization was when you started with it. Now, mind you, that was a while ago. But to be able to scale that that culture, to be able to scale that enthusiasm around what you're doing as an organization is no easy task. You know, another thing that is not necessarily – it's going to be an interesting pivot here. But you mentioned about Reseda, um, your uh, credit union uh, organization that really invests in – innovative new fintech solutions that can help your organization as well as other credit unions. Can you discuss a little bit about your why around your wholly owned credit service organization and then a little bit around where you are today? Yeah. Um, so the why is a multitude of things to be truthful. And it, um, it sometimes I think, you know, you have ideas and, you know, and then all of a sudden they collide and then it's like, ah, this is what we need to do. And that's kind of what happened. So a couple of things. So one, we have always created a lot of our own software internally. And in the, in the industry space, I was getting more and more people asking, um, who's your vendor for X? And I was like, well, we made that. And then people are like, oh, well, can I buy it from you? And I was like, I don't know how that would work. <laughs> um, and then we were going to conferences and seeing, you know, some new fintech speakers. And, um, and I was like, oh, we really need, you know, uh, a great example is changed. It's, uh, you know, a roundup to pay off our student loans. And, you know, our organization serves a lot of students with student loans. And I was like, that'd be a great ad for our members. Um, and then you learn about fintechs and you learn that, you know, they need investments and they need 
pilot, um, you know, clients in order to prove their, you know, white paper use case to get more investment to be able to scale. And, you know, so when we talked what changed, it became, well, we want to work with you, we'll do a pilot. And, um, you know, they're like, well, will you invest in us? And I was like, I have to figure that out, right? You have to become a QSO for a credit union to invest in you. Um, and so then, um, and then the last part was, is that we were looking to diversify income and revenue, just like everyone else. Um, especially as we approach 10 billion, uh, in assets for our organization, that means changes in some of our interchange earnings. And so we needed replacement revenue. Um, and so all those things started coming together. And so we formed Reseda, I guess maybe because I like things a little neat and tidy, um, to put all of our investments under this umbrella umbrella versus, you know, direct from the credit union. Um, and, and through that, you know, you make your first investment and you partner with your first fintech and you become a little more popular, um, with all the others in the, (laughs) in that space, because, you know, we are a reasonably sized credit union that, um, can help them scale and, and really provide access to a larger group of, you know, members to test with and, create use cases. So that's been kind of fun. And I really believe in the industry, our organization is at a size that we have the ability to make investments. Um, But I also believe if we didn't make the investments in the fintechs, that they would look to venture capital, they would look to private equity, they would look to banks. And then that software may not be prolifically available to our industry. And I think for the industry to remain relevant, we all need access to new technology to deliver to our members. And so if we can help our own members and then by doing this, maybe provide access to all members of other credit unions um, is is part of the global industry success. You know, it's interesting just from a press release basis. It doesn't look like you ever sit still. I mean, you recently invested $2 million in five new startups, fintech startups, and after that, you acquired a digital engagement platform, ChannelNet. How many partners and investments do you have currently? And can you discuss how you select these organizations and how these fit into your overall portfolio solutions? So I think we're up to 26 investments oh right gosh. now. Um, and there might be three or four still in the queue um, to be evaluated. And so we we do a couple of things for selection. Um, one is it something that we would use ourselves because for me, this, when we talk about it and we have a separate board for our QSO um, as well for the Reseda group. And, and we, re- you know, we present to the board our intentions for investment and their approval. Um, we didn't do this, this initiative just for revenue, right? We did it to, find the right products and services that we couldn't create ourselves fast enough or, you know, inexpensively enough to do that. So in the sense of we want to have an investment of something that we see the technology being relevant to the membership or the global membership. So there's, you know, we look at, would we use them? Change is a great example. Um, We have invested in a company called Prize Out, um, which is the ability to, you know, use your credit union debit card, buy a gift card. Let's say you're going shopping at Target. Um, You could go buy a Target gift card. And actually, if you're going to buy a gift card for $100, Target may incent you to make sure you get Target. They may give you 110, right? So you're doing the same spend, but the consumer is having access to more value for their dollar. And then, of course, you know, we have uh, a little bit of revenue from that purchase. And and so I think it helps the consumer do more with their money, helps the credit union um, grow a little bit in revenue. So we look at this combination um, and then you know, what I wasn't planning, but um, turned out to be a great uh, investment as well, is we did a little down supply um, in in acquisition. So we acquired the company that did all of the credit unions printing, and we acquired an ad agency that we partnered with. Um, Yeah, not because we went asking them, 
the the owners saw what we were doing. You know, they also read the news releases and and said, "You're buying some companies. You know, you're one of our bigger clients. Would you? We'd like to be a part of this." Um, it helped them with a path to grow because they would have access to credit unions and different you know spaces. Um, and so through that, we have also consolidated out expenses, right? In the accounting world, um, you know, if we're paying, we're buying from each other, you can have some consolidated savings. Um, and so we really have this blend of uh, diversified portfolio. Now we have some technology companies, we have some of our suppliers, um, we have some of our QSO investments are um, in real estate and uh credit union executive benefits. And so they're all at different stages of revenue and maturity, which kind of balance our portfolio. So we don't just have startups all in a lost position, um, but wanting to make sure that these products and services are in our industry and available. So it's been kind of fun to see all of our partners also connect together once a quarter and they're figuring out how can we make stuff together, um, which is also somewhat fun. You know, it's interesting because in some cases that I see you're a primary, you're a, a major uh, a player in their investments. In some cases, you're not as major. What changed in March of this year when uh, Silicon Valley Bank went under? How did you have to reevaluate your investments, at least in those organizations where you weren't the primary investor? You know, so it, it it depends, right? We we get asked a lot, like, what is our appetite for investment, and and it varies based upon the scope and the size of the organization. That's you know where they are in their um, startup, but definitely you can see a shift in the environment today where there isn't as much funding available, um, and you know. We had some of our fintech partners, right, who had relationships with Silicon Valley, you know, reach out. Um, I, you know, I, I may want to reconsider my, you know, my, our company's banking relationships and, and so forth as well. Um, and so it really did, I think, change how people evaluate who they partner with from the fintech side as well, right? Um, it, they want to do some of maybe their due diligence on their partners differently and, um, so that's been kind of a, a fun and, and interesting new uh, experience that we've been having with with our partners. Um, you know, the investment amounts it really just depends on the scope and the size of the organization where they are. We we will help a, a startup. We'll add to you know like a certain series round um, based upon our engagement and how maybe we're using the the software more and we can see that it's um growing and so we'll sometimes we'll circle back and we'll add to um our initial investment to protect our um ownership percentages uh you know so it, it's it's this whole blend in a in a very large portfolio you know i i think you mentioned in the discussion around this organization that you also sell these services to other credit unions how do you build those partnerships? I mean, how do they find you or how do you find them? How do you work as, as partly as a, as a sales organization to deploy these solutions? Yeah, well, thankfully, I'm no longer um, the chief sales officer, and we have uh, hired someone whose job is to help um, create those sales opportunities, and we go in a variety of spaces and do that. So we also, you know, exhibit at some of the major credit union um, you know, conferences, we'll have a booth for Reseda and we'll put all of our Reseda made products um, there. But we also invite our investing partners to to have some space there so people can, you know, they may not be able to get a booth on their own. So we collaborate together on that. Um, and then we partner through credit union leagues, um, to help us, you know, get the word out. We have a salesperson, right. Who's making calls to credit unions. Um, we cultivate leads at the shows just like all other, you know, vendors, I guess. <laughs> yeah. You're playing both sides of the equation there. You know, yeah. when, when you look at the future, I mean, I'm sure you're continually looking at gaps within your own organization and within the industry to say, you know, what solutions do we need to have? When you look, you know, in the in the future, in the near term, 
what gaps are you trying to fill right now with your investments? What what solutions are you you keen on right now that you say, boy, this is something we really have to take care of? Um, I think for us right now, we're focused on small business uh, and small business, either lending or small business platforms. Um, I think we see a great need, especially uh, after the pandemic, right, that small business uh, needs a, a good partner and they're looking for you know, access to lines of credit. They're looking to have someone, you know, who can spend some time sharing with them, you know, their, how to manage their operating accounts and, and, you know, what's the best money management for their organization. And so we, um, ha- are, you know, partnering with a couple of organizations, um, you know, to maybe look at some new small business decision-making engines, delivery, um, of certain products, uh, just to round out that, For us, small business is a new growing market segment, and and we want to be able to to get in with the right products and tools on the front end. So when you're looking at all these digital solutions and when you're growing your own organization around the digital experience, how do you balance the need to improve digital experiences while still having the ability to connect with your members on a human basis, what differentiates your brand and makes it so that you bring these two elements, these important elements together? Yeah. So we actually have in our vision statement, um, you know, humans and technology working together is, uh, you know, in this, in this statement to deliver, you know, outstanding member experiences um, and make it accessible for all. Right. So there's, there's parts of, um, well, I know, right. So I get questions a lot because we actually build branches and I get, you know, just this last week, I think American banker was like, why are you building branches? Um, and you build, I, headqu- you build headquarters too, right? We build all kinds of stuff. Right? And so, you know, I, I tell everyone we wouldn't build a branch if it wasn't financially successful in the end. And we wouldn't do the digital channels if they don't, you know, we have a financial return as well. We're not a charitable organization. Um, and, and so what happens is there is members that want to engage only digitally. There's members that only want to engage in a physical space. And then there's members who utilize the channels based on their moment in time need. And, and so we have a great need for human interaction. I, I tease everyone. I think it's because we're based in the Midwest and, you know, our branches. I have a branch that sees almost a thousand people a day. Um, and and should that shows you the value of a branch. And then you know, we do our data on the branches. 25% of the people coming in are, you know, classified as Generation Z and 25% of the people coming in are, you know, classified as a boomer and above. And and so everyone thinks that only a certain age group uses a physical location and wants human interaction. That's not true. Um, I, it really is what you need in the moment. Do I need advice? Do I need to understand something? If I'm young and this is my first time, my identity has been stolen and I need to know what to do. They want to talk to a person who can help them feel you know, taken care of, um, you know, if it's their first car purchase, whatever it may be for the first time, it really is an experience people like in person. Our branches, when we put a new branch in a market, grow 30% within less than 24 months most of the time. So you you have a system down then that doesn't do it on its own. No. And so, but we, in the branch, right, we've integrated technology as well. So people check themselves in, it's more efficient. I can get myself in line before I get to the branch. I can schedule an appointment, all the technology aspects that people like when they're trying to come to a branch and they may want to expedite their time. Um, And then we have tools in the branch, right, to show you how to use the digital experiences, to demo the new offerings, our employees, know how to, you know, show you, well, would you like to, I see you have a student loan on your account. Let me demo changed and how you can sign up for it. Um, and so I think they work hand in hand at all times. Um, you know, the, the phones 
system has a digital component to route you, but it gets you to a human. Um, all those things work together. We have a chat bot who um, handles 76% of our chats, our live chats. Um, but, you know, that means 24% are being passed to a, a human agent because they're more complex or that person just feels better working with the human. We want to meet everyone where they are, I guess. And uh, it is obviously takes more time and effort and, and more investment to to make sure you get all the channels working individually well and working well together. So beyond what you're doing with Acida, you also obviously engage in third-party solution providers to create better products, services, and engagements with members beyond what you do with Acida, as I mentioned. How do you select partners that you'll engage with and why do you expand beyond your current primary service provider? We select partners um, in a in the thought process of again, they're an extension of our organization. So, are you wanting to truly partner with us, or do you just want to sell us something? Do you want to help us meet our goals? Do you want to hear our feedback? Can we create together? Um, can I call you if something goes awry and you take my phone call and help us solve? you know, the moment, uh, the challenge. And so we can get back to serving members. Um, and so we really have a service expectation from our partners that is beyond just, you know, give me access to this software and, and we'll sign a contract. Uh, we really do want to create together. And I think, um, that makes us unique sometimes. And I'm often told no one else has asked us if we could do X. And, um, and I was like, that's okay, but we did. And are you willing to entertain the idea? Um, so I think for me, that's, that's a, a really big part of it uh, is what are you doing that is unique that we cannot do ourselves? And there are lots of people that can do that. Um, and it's more cost effective for us to partner than build. And, and that, you know, the larger we are, that becomes you know, a, a more viable direction over time. So it's interesting. I find in the credit union space more than the even the community banking space, there's a lot of time and effort spent on financial wellness solutions. And MSU, FCU is no exception. In fact, you have a vast array of solutions out there for your members. Now, what's interesting, though, is sometimes you, it's, I would imagine, I, I've been a long time since I've been in banking, but I would imagine it's sometimes hard to monetize the value of this focus right at the beginning. And, and you know, it's, you sometimes do things for doing them for the right reason. But how do you monetize the value of focuses that maybe aren't as traditionally revenue centric? I look at it this way. I would say it's not revenue centric, right, to provide people financial education, except if they understand how to manage their finances, there's a lot of great revenue that ultimately comes out of that. Um, meaning I know how to save. I know how to pay my bills on time. I don't end up in collections. Um, I know how to manage a budget. I know how to read my credit report. I know um, how to watch for fraud. All those things actually do have, you know, some earnings opportunity for the credit union. Um, you know, I think credit unions are very mission driven and we were created to serve the underserved. And in order for the underserved to not remain underserved, they need a path out and education is always that way. And, and so for us, it is part of the mission, um, to help people just be in a better long-term financial position that I think, benefits the institution that they have an account with. It benefits their community. Community. It obviously benefits themselves. Um, and there's nothing wrong with everyone winning in that picture. So uh, financial education is a great path to success. You know, when you look at the industry today, um, the economic situation, the financial industry situation, things are changing so quickly, as you mentioned at the beginning around the, the challenge, you know, the biggest challenge is trying to stay ahead of that change. What challenges do you see on the horizon, be it immediate or maybe farther in the future? What do you see and say, boy, there, there are, it's not all good and happy. There are storm clouds in some cases. I think we have, in, you know, we've been talking about it forever. I can't tell you how many books I've read about 
Google, Apple, Amazon, Facebook, you know, going to, you know, compete in financial services and it's happening. Right. Um, I, I've been an Apple user, you know, since the, the, the little tiny QE computer and I had the first iPod and, you know, the phone and I'm a big Mac fan. And so there, I'm not the only one in the world. There's millions of them. And so when Apple goes out and partners and offers you a credit card and offers you a high rate savings. You're like, I like Apple. Um, and they've done great by me. And this experience to set it up is pretty easy on my phone, which is now always attached to me. And, and so I think there's more and more of that that's going to come into the competitor space. And I always tell everybody, right, each competitor just takes 1% and 1%. And then we're, you know, someday there's enough competitors and they all took their 1%. We're, who are we left with? Um, you know, you think about stored value and my Starbucks card, you think about, you know, stored value in Venmo or PayPal or all those other spaces where those funds used to be held at the financial institution where they have their accounts makes it harder. And so we have to, you know, really have a great story that people don't want to leave us for some of the other new emerging opportunities. Um, And then I think for us, we looked at it as in the fintech space, right? If our members go to example changed and look in the drop down to, you know, round up from our institution to make their student loan payment, we're not in the list. They're going to think, oh, I need to go and I really want to pay down my student loan faster. I need to go to a different main financial institution for my account. And then that's that 1% leaving, right? And so you really do need to make sure you're relevant in a lot of spaces and competition is heating up every day. um, And we can't pretend it's not happening. You know, it's interesting. You, You said it so well that we kind of forget that while we have all of our members or customers, that they have other relationships. And we look at, a tra- we use the traditional way of looking at attrition back in your day as a marketing associate was, okay, we're going to take how many people have left against the entire portfolio, and that's our attrition rate. Well, today it's not that easy because people don't leave their legacy organization to move someplace else. I know I have, I, I've had the same personal and business relationships. However, in both situations, I have a lot of other providers and Many organizations don't look at flow of funds. So when the government provided, you know, uh, COVID uh, funding, people didn't look and say, geez, look at I have all these savings accounts now that I didn't have before. I have all this money. Well, they didn't look at how many people transferred a good portion of money to someplace else and where that place was. So I think, you know, as a leader looking at what is out there as competition continuously Keeps you sharp. I, I think, you know, it can't be underestimated the power of, uh, of of a challenger mindset, continually looking and saying, how can we do better? And how can I be the apple in the person's pocket? So finally, and, and this, this question I only ask of the top leaders that I talk to, but when you get out of the banking world, what do you want your legacy to be as a banker, as a credit union executive? Uh, you know, I, I try to always make it not about me. That's, uh, you know, it's uh, I'm an introverted person by nature. And so it always is hard because it is becomes about you, the leader. Um, but I really want it to be that I left the organization in a position to be successful in the long term, that we didn't just come and do what was necessary to keep the doors open, but we really set us up for the long-term future. And that means with engaged employees, with the right, you know, mindset for technology and innovation, uh, because that's how you'll continue to win. And, and I hope that, you know, people build on that and continue to find ways to be relevant and innovative so we can keep winning that share wallet from the membership. April, it's been great having you on the show. It's, it's also been a great pleasure because you're the, one of the people that have been a surprise in my past where, <laughs> where I wasn't sure what to expect, but was completely blown away when you're on the panel with a lot of organizations that were bigger than you that are already recognized in the marketplace. And, and I'm sure we're going to see a lot more of you in the future because you are marching to the beat of a different drummer, but that doesn't mean it's bad or risky. It really is 
not only helping your organization, but it's, it, you know, we didn't get into it deeply, but how you're helping other credit unions survive and thrive. So I wish you the best of luck. I hope you keep on doing what you're doing because it is exciting. And it does show, as I said, in the way your employees and, and people respond to uh, being a great place to work, which at the end of the day helps the community you serve as well as your members. So thank you so much again for being on the show. Thank you. It was very kind. Thanks for listening to the Visionaries podcast. We hope you enjoyed our deep dive into the tips and tricks you can use to help elevate your digital game. If you enjoyed this episode and would like to help support the podcast, please share with others both inside and outside your organization. Post it on social media and give it a thumbs up and comment. This has been a production of Evergreen Podcast. A special thank you to our senior producer, Leah Haslidge, and audio and video engineer, Chris Fafalias. I'm your host, Jim Roos. Until next time, remember, sometimes the road less traveled is the best path for growth. 